Hello there, and welcome back to Construction Grammar and its application to English. This is already the fifth video, and in this video I will be talking about information packaging or information structure, as it's often called. And to get us started, let me ask a very simple question, namely, um, what are constructions good for? Um, based on what you've already heard about construction grammar and constructions, what would you say constructions are good for? Well, it turns out different types of construction serve different purposes. So for simple words, we might ask that they're useful because they provide us with labels for things in the world or ideas in the world or relations between things or ideas. Morphological constructions, and we've talked about morphological constructions in the last video, specifically inflectional morphological constructions serve the purpose of encoding basic conceptual distinctions. So think of the plural construction. Uh, that construction encodes the distinction between one and many. We have tense constructions that encode the distinction between now versus before. And for instance, we have verbal agreement constructions that encode the difference between I and you and they and um, so on and so forth. Okay. In connection with argument structure constructions, I've mentioned this idea, the scene encoding hypothesis, the idea that basic clausal patterns in a language encode basic conceptual scenes that are recurrent frames of human experience, acts of giving, acting on an object, moving about, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, we have these basic syntactic constructions, noun phrases, prepositional phrases, and so on and so forth. And you might say that these are useful for relating ideas to one another, so constructing complex ideas out of simple ones. Now, this gives you a nice little inventory of things that constructions are good for, but I would argue that we're missing one important function of constructions, and that function I uh, will talk about in this video. There are constructions that seem to serve a different purpose, and I've brought a couple of examples here. Um, as for John, he lost his wallet. He lost his wallet, John. What happened was that John lost his wallet. What John did was lose his wallet. It was John who lost his wallet. What John lost was his wallet. So. I think you agree with me in saying that all of these can be paraphrased with the simple sentence, John lost his wallet, which raises the question, why on earth does a language need six or maybe even more paraphrases of a simple sentence like John lost his wallet? Why this luxurious syntactic variety? What do you think? Well, um, <clears throat> of course, this is no luxury, but there are clear functions um, associated with this variety. And in particular, these constructions uh, that you've seen on the last slide, they can be called information packaging constructions. And their main purpose is to organize and arrange meanings, and particularly um, to relate new meanings to old meanings. Why would you do that? Well, relating new meanings to old meanings, um, that's important because it facilitates communication and facilitates the hearer's job of integrating new information with what is already known because the construction signal, okay, here comes a piece of information that you already know, here comes a new piece of information, so make sure you pay attention. That's what information packaging constructions do. So, you notice we are moving into the territory of pragmatics with information packaging constructions and traditionally uh, pragmatics is thought of as the study of context dependent meanings in linguistic utterances. So if I had to uh, summarize pragmatics in just seven words I would say pragmatics more is meant than what is said. So we're dealing with meanings that are context dependent and conversely they are relatively independent of linguistic form. If you want to 
uh, get somebody to close the window, you can either formulate a simple request or you can say something about how you're feeling cold or you can mention that there might be a draft in the room. All of these things you can say and independently of the linguistic form you will be able to convey this meaning. Please close the window. Now, if constructions are thought of as form meaning pairs, yeah, so a form conventionally tied to a certain meaning, uh, that means that this view of pragmatics is a little difficult actually for our theory. How do construction grammar and pragmatics fit together if there are no conventional ties between a construction and its contextual meaning? Yeah, that's something of a challenge, but we will see that in information packaging constructions there are indeed conventionally associated pragmatic practices associated with syntactic, morphosyntactic forms. And to illustrate that, I have brought a little fictional dialogue here between you and your mother. So imagine that your phone is ringing, you're picking up, you say hello, and you hear a voice, uh, it's your mother, what John lost was his wallet. And I think you would agree with me that this is a slightly odd way to open a conversation. And the question is, if what John lost his wallet can be paraphrased by John lost his wallet, why is this an odd way to open a conversation? Do you have an idea? Well, I would invite you to think about this. Um, think about the sentence, what John lost was his wallet. In what communicative situations would this sentence be uttered um, and meaningfully be uttered? Yeah. So I would like you to pause this video, imagine a context and write down a short dialogue. Ready? Okay, then I'll continue now. <clears throat> so, if you examine the context or your little dialogue or whatever, uh, I'm fairly sure that three points will match your context. Namely, first, the interlocutors have already talked about John. John is a piece of common ground. Um, second, they also already talked about John losing something. And then third, there is a contrast between the lost thing that was talked about and the thing that was actually lost. So the speaker is compelled to make a correction to something that the hearer might assume or might think. Yeah. So no, 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 he, he didn't lose his keys. He lost his wallet. What John lost was his wallet. Right. Um, you don't have to take that from me or indeed from your own uh, speculations. But let us look at a few authentic examples of this construction. This construction, by the way, is called a WH cleft or a pseudo cleft. Um, and let me read out an example to you. Uh, Even during the darkest years, Churchill never entirely lost the affection of his countrymen. What he lost was their confidence. So, um, let's go back to these three points. So, the interlocutors have already talked about John, or indeed, uh, Winston. Churchill. Uh, they already talked about Churchill losing something, in this case the affection of his countrymen, and there's a contrast between the lost thing that was talked about earlier and the thing that was actually lost, namely um, he didn't lose the affection of his countrymen, instead he lost their confidence. And if you look at the other two examples on the slide, <clears throat> you will find that the structures are completely in parallel to that. So, this means that information packaging constructions, such as WH clefts, are sensitive to the structure of the communicative situation. Um, they're sensitive to what has been said before, they're sensitive to what has not been said before, and they tie in with what the hero can, can be expected to know already. And, um, well, taking into account that in this WH cleft, there are several pieces of common ground that already need to be established uh, that explains why it is odd to open a conversation with a WH cleft. There you have it. So, where was I? So, 
When speakers use an information packaging construction, such as the WH cleft, they make an educated guess as to what it is the hearer already knows. Yeah? You engage in some sort of mind reading, and that's not a hocus-pocus activity, that's a very pedestrian, commonsensical way to interact with your fellow human beings. And if people fail to make reasonable assumptions about what it is that you know, you think, oh, God, what is wrong with them? <laughs> yeah. Or you think, oh, well, they're really impolite. But more often you will think something is seriously wrong with them. Okay. Um, with all this in mind, let me try and define information packaging. Um, and I'm going to present to you a definition by one of the uh, leading figures in uh, research on information packaging, um, namely Knut Lambrecht. And he offers a definition that is very good, but at the same time very dense, so it needs some unpacking. Um, let me read it to you once, and then I'll go through the individual pieces, and we'll try to make sense of it uh, together. So, Knut Lambrecht. Uh, information structure, according to him, is that component of sentence grammar in which propositions as conceptual representations of states of affairs are paired with lexicogrammatical structures in accordance with the mental states of interlocutors who use and interpret these structures as units of information in given discourse contexts. Whew. That is a mouthful. So let's start with perhaps the most intelligible part of it, lexicogrammatical structures. We're talking about constructions, yeah? So there is some morphosyntactic material involved here. Lexicogrammatical structures. Those are structures like the WH cleft construction that I already mentioned, what John lost was his wallet. Um, there are also it clefts. It was the butler who killed her. And uh, there are, I mean, there's a bunch of uh, information, packaging constructions. Left dislocation is another one. My brother, he knows everything about computers. Right, so those are the structures that we're talking about. Um, they are sentence level construction, so that's why he says it's a piece of sentence grammar. Um, the second part of this definition that is important is this one here, propositions as conceptual representations of states of affairs. There are actually two parts to this, so let's uh, deal with propositions first. What are propositions? Well, there's of course a technical definition of proposition from the philosophical literature. Um, <clears throat> philosophy of language, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> um, a proposition, that's a complex idea. Not a complex idea as in globalization or DNA. Um, that's a complex idea, but, well, here a proposition is more like the idea of an event that involves several participants. So, for instance, an event of losing something that involved John and his wallet. Uh, we have several participants, we have a loser, we have a lost item, and maybe we have a place and a time. Yeah, all of those um, items of information belong to this event of losing something. <clears throat> so that's a proposition. Um, second part here is the conceptual representation of that proposition, um, the way in which the proposition is presented, which part of the proposition is highlighted, and indeed you may highlight different aspects of it. There may be a focus on the loser, there may be a focus on the lost item, or the focus may indeed uh, include the whole process of losing something. Think of it as you, know, you have a flashlight and you can highlight different aspects of a scene. Yeah, either the loser, the lost item, or you can take a step back and shine a light on everything there is. Right, that's that. And then the third and most important part really is uh, this here, uh, in accordance with the mental states of interlocutors. This is the mind reading aspect that I alluded to earlier. So speakers who use information packaging constructions engage in mind reading. They guess what it is the hero knows and they also guess what the hero does not know, and they present new information accordingly. 
And why do they do that? Well, they signal to the hero, look here, this is information I think you already know. But here, this I think is new to you, so make sure you pay attention. Um, and, well, these information packaging constructions, of course, they are known to the hero. So if I, as a hero, observe somebody use an information packaging construction, I can already know, okay, now is the important part coming. So right now the speaker is saying something that the two of us share, they think at least, and then they're presenting something that they think is new to me. And you can see how that is very advantageous from a processing perspective. So I already am alerted when I need to pay attention. It's not that I need to pay attention all the time. Um, so there are moments when I can relax when uh, I know, okay, it's only old information, it's only old information, and as long as there's no surprises there, I'm fine. But when the moment arrives and the new thing comes up, then I need to pay attention. Right, um, so coming back to Knut Lambrecht's definition, um, let me rephrase the definition by saying that information packaging constructions are sentence-level constructions, like WH clefts, like it clefts, that speakers use to express complex meanings, propositions, um, in different ways, focusing on one element or another, in a way that shows awareness of the current knowledge of the hearer, that is, in a way that shows alignment between what I know, what you know, and what I'm telling you now, so that we know it together. Right. Um, in order to analyze information packaging constructions, we need to go through a couple of technical terms. And the first pair of technical terms I want to introduce are pragmatic presupposition and pragmatic assertion. Uh, here's again Knut Lambrecht speaking. Pragmatic presupposition is uh, the set of propositions lexicogrammatically evoked in a sentence, which the speaker assumes the hearer already knows or is ready to take for granted at the time the sentence is uttered. So this is old information. Or it is information that maybe the hearer uh, does not know, but is ready to take for granted, so they won't challenge this information. New information then corresponds to the pragmatic assertion, the proposition expressed by a sentence which the hearer is expected to know or take for granted as a result of hearing the sentence uttered. So, old and new, more or less. Uh, this can be illustrated with an information packaging construction, namely tough raising. Um, you will heard of this. Um, uh, Proust is tough to read. Yeah, that's where the tough comes from. Um, the examples that you have here, hard to understand, difficult to handle, expensive to maintain. <clears throat> so you have an adjective and then uh, an infinitive complement. And what's information structural about this? What's uh, information packaging me about this? Well, if you look at the subjects of tough phrasing constructions, it turns out that most of the time they have already been mentioned. So they are old information. And then... Um, so that is the pragmatic presupposition. They belong to the pragmatic presupposition. And pragmatic assertion is, the new stuff is, that mm, this is hard to understand, difficult to handle, something expensive to maintain. Something new is said about them. Okay, let's look at this. Uh, let me read the first example to you. Until the last few years, the paper was a modestly profitable business, but it had structural problems for some time. Like so much else in Britain, these are hard to understand unless you know the history. So you notice that the subject uh, is a pronoun, these, and refers back to structural problems. So problems have already been talked about that is, forms part of the common stock of ideas that hearer and speaker have in common. Well, this is writing, of course, but nonetheless. <clears throat> so uh, the new part of the pragmatic assertion is that these problems are hard to understand unless you know the history. 
And if you look at the two other examples, you'll come to similar conclusions. Right, a second uh, concept that is important is activation. Activation um, that answers the question, what ideas are currently active in the hearer's mind? So when you use constructions such as WH clefts, tough raising or relative clause constructions, you choose them according to the current knowledge of the hearer that requires you to model continuously what the hearer knows. You're always updating your knowledge of somebody else's knowledge and presumably they do that too so everybody has models of models of models of models of models who uh, they have to stop at one point um, and you generate estimates about what the hearer might be able to figure out on the basis of that knowledge so clearly they can't think of everything at the same time but they can figure out nearly everything on the basis that uh, on the basis of the stuff that they already are thinking of. Here's an example of activation. Um, John speaks excellent Finnish, although he's never lived there. Notice that um, this little word here, there, refers to in Finland. And remarkably enough, Finland has never been mentioned in this video. Yeah, But nonetheless, I was able to pronominalize it and you got it. So that means that something must have activated this idea of Finland in your mind and surprise surprise Finnish, duh, um, Finnish activates the idea of Finland making it a candidate for pronominalization. Activation. Um, activation has very characteristic uh, repercussions for linguistic structure, um, mostly pronominalization, definiteness, but also omission. And uh, uh, Walsh Chafe talks about this famously, and uh, I'm going to read this out for you. Those concepts which are already active for the speaker, and which the speaker judges to be active for the hearer as well, are verbalized in a special way, having properties which have often been discussed in terms of old or given information. The general thing to say that is that given concepts are spoken with an attenuated pronunciation, so um, <clears throat> a uh, not so prominent pronunciation. The attenuation involves at the very least weak stress. Typically, though not always, it involves either pronominalization or omission from verbalization altogether. Okay. Here's another a uh, little dialogue uh, that shows activation. So again, the phone rings, you pick it up, and, well, it's your mother again. It's your mother. Guess what? Mary's pregnant again. You say, wow. Uh, and your mother continues, they could see on the ultrasound that it's a boy. And what is remarkable about this conversation, this time it works, it works perfectly, but notice what's remarkable is that um, there are so many things that your mother does not express. Yeah, they could see on the ultrasound that it's a boy. It, it's a pronoun, refers back to a baby. Yeah, a baby hasn't been mentioned before, but pregnant evokes the idea uh, of a baby being around somewhere. Yeah, and then we have they. They could see on the ultrasound. Well, you have no trouble figuring out who they are. It's Mary and uh, the other parent and perhaps the obstetrician. So, evidence that activation is really all over the place and uh, here your mother gauges very well your ability to figure out, uh, to, to get two ideas from the stuff that is currently active in your mind. <clears throat> More technical terms, topic and focus. These are notoriously different, uh, difficult because there are so many definitions of them floating about. Um, here I give you the definitions from Knut Lambrecht again, and he defines topic as that what a sentence is about, the subject matter of a sentence. And this is tricky because sometimes the topic may not even be explicitly mentioned in the sentence. Uh, consider an example such as, personally, I don't even eat chicken, I prefer my proteins to come from eggs, fish, and cheese. What is that sentence about? Is it about chicken? Is it about 
eggs or cheese or about proteins. Most likely it's about something like eating habits and eating habits, so the word habit is nowhere to be found in that sentence. Topic. <clears throat> there are certain topicalization constructions that um, explicitly signal to the hearer what the topic of a sentence is. So there's a construction called as for topicalization. As for John, he lost his wallet. You've seen that. Left dislocation is a topicalization construction. Uh, the coolest guitar I own. Uh, it's a black U.S. Stratocaster from the 1980s. Yeah, so this sentence is about a cool guitar. Um, most heavy metal I don't really like. Yeah. <clears throat> Topicalization construction. Um, correspondingly, there is uh, the idea of focus, and Lambrecht defines focus as that element of information whereby the pragmatic presupposition and the pre pragmatic assertion differ from each other. Pragmatic presupposition, pragmatic assertion, we've talked about that. And, uh, well, let me illustrate this concept of focus with the small example that you see here. Where did you end up last night? At the hotel bar or in the nightclub? Speaker B answers, in the nightclub. And notice that in the nightclub is not new uh, information. Uh, the nightclub has already been mentioned. So what is focal here? What is the thing whereby the pragmatic presupposition and the pragmatic assertion differ is that the place where speaker B ended up at, that is the nightclub. So the connection between the place of ending up and the nightclub, that is the focus. Uh, the focus piece of information here. Focus has a number of repercussions on prosody. So um, <clears throat> the same sentence may be pronounced in very different ways depending on what the focal element is. And you can modify the focal element by modifying um, the question that elicits the sentence as an answer. So if I ask, what happened to your car? Um, I will pronounce a sentence such as, well, my car broke down. Um, I heard your motorcycle broke down. No, my car broke down. Why are you late? My car broke down. Yeah, these have different prosodies that correspond to differences in focus, and Lambrecht calls these predicate focus, argument focus, and sentence focus, respectively. Now, the interesting bit is how do information packaging and grammar relate to one another? What are information packaging constructions doing? And uh, in order to approach this question, I want to say a few things about clefts because they are a very prominent type of information packaging constructions. <clears throat> I realize there are a bunch of definitions in this video, but nonetheless, um, you'll survive that. Um, what are cleft sentences? Well, a cleft construction, this is Knut Lambert speaking, <laughs> just in case you were wondering. Uh, a cleft construction is a complex sentence structure consisting of a matrix clause headed by a copula and a relative or relative like clause whose relativized argument is co-indexed with a predicative element or argument of the copula. Taken together, the matrix and the relative uh, express a logically simple proposition, which can also be expressed in the form of a single clause without a change in truth conditions. Okay, some unpacking needed also here. A cleft construction consists of something like a, a predicative clause, x is y, and the second part of it is a relative clause or a relative like clause. And these are co-indexed in a certain way uh, so that a part of the predicate of construction also plays a role in the relative clause. And then the whole thing can be rephrased, can be paraphrased in a single clause uh, with the same meaning as far as truth conditions are concerned. So the broad meaning is the same. Um, what John lost his wallet corresponds to John lost his wallet. 
Right. Um, here are three types of cleft sentence that you should be familiar with. Uh, the first is the it cleft. It's the wife who decides, corresponds to the wife decides. The second is the WH cleft or pseudo cleft that you've already seen. What I want is a gin and tonic. I want a gin and tonic. And then there is um, a lesser variety of clefts, um, TH cleft. That's what I'm talking about. Um, or reverse clefts. It's sometimes called. Um, I'm talking about that. Right. Um, WH clefts and also the other clefts can be analyzed in terms of you know, what kind of pragmatic presupposition they have, what kind of pragmatic assertion they have, and what focal element they have. So if there's a question, what do you need? And that question is answered with a WH cleft. What I need is a sheet of paper and a pencil. There is um, the pragmatic presupposition. The speaker needs something. Yeah? Um, and the assertion is that um, this something is a sheet of paper and a pencil. And the focus um, is also a sheet of paper and a pencil. And you notice that this uh, characterization holds not only for um, WH clefts, but also for IT clefts. If we do the same exercise for IT clefts, WH clefts, reverse WH clefts, uh, so we have it's the use of clefts that he wants to explain. What he wants to explain is the use of clefts, and the use of clefts is what he wants to explain. Then you notice that in each of these three, um, the pragmatic presupposition, pragmatic assertion, and focus is actually the same which raises the question, okay, if they are the same, why do we need three types of cleft? What are the differences? Is there a functional motivation for having uh, all three of them? In short, yes, there are explanations. And um, four differences I would like to present to you uh, in the last part of this video. So a first difference between uh, different cleft types, the well, one thing that may govern the choices between one type of cleft and another is the length of the focus phrase. Compare these two sentences that you see on this slide and tell me which one, well you can't tell me, but consider which one you would like to, which one you would prefer. So option one, it's the use of clefts in English medical writing from the 16th to the 18th century that he wants to explain. Or, option two, what he wants to explain is the use of clefts in English medical writings from the 16th to the 18th century. Now, if you're like me, you prefer the second variant. And you prefer the second variant because, well, in this case, the focus phrase, um, uh, the use of clefts in English medical writings from the 16th to the 18th century. That is a very long noun phrase. And uh, there's a preference for speakers uh, to have these very lengthy phrases at the end of an utterance. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, in the first example, it's the use of clefts in English and so on and so forth. Um, there, we have to <clears throat> process this phrase and we have to keep the rest of the sentence in mind for the time that we process this phrase and all of that is a fairly heavy load on our working memory um, so that feels uncomfortable or it feels stressful whereas in the second example what he wants to explain is there we have all the sentence figured out and we know okay now it's just a noun phrase that follows and that noun phrase then can be as long as anybody would like like it to be so length of the focus phrase uh, the principle of end weight is at work here if you want to look that up um, the second difference concerns the activeness of the pragmatic presupposition so imagine that you approach a stranger in a foreign city um, and you say one of the three 
following sentences. Excuse me, I'm looking for the British Museum. Excuse me, what I'm looking for is the British Museum. Or, excuse me, it's the British Museum that I'm looking for. Well, which one would you choose? There's one clear uh, candidate, and that is the first option. Excuse me, I'm looking for the British Museum. Because there you have a simple sentence, a simple declarative sentence, um, that does not make any assumptions about previously established common ground. The two clefts, the WH cleft and the IT cleft, they do make assumptions about things that are already shared. Um, in particular, what is presupposed, yeah, the pragmatic presupposition is that I'm looking for something. And you can imagine that, well, this maybe this idea may be active in the hearer if they see you um, you know, with some map of London upside down and you have a big camera dangling from your chest and maybe you have a t-shirt that says I love London. Um, so somebody approaching you and, and you're standing there being totally lost, they can see or at least get the idea that you are looking for something and so it may not be totally inappropriate to expect them to know. If you do that, which one of options two or three would you choose? Excuse me, what I'm looking for is the British Museum or excuse me, it's the British Museum that I'm looking for. The option that I would choose is the second one. What I'm looking for is the British Museum. So um, in a WH cleft, um, the pragmatic presupposition does not need to be quite as strong as in the it cleft. In the it cleft, the pragmatic presupposition needs to be firmly, firmly established. And no doubt whatsoever that we're talking about common ground here. Um, so both parties need to be super sure that the, the speaker is looking for something. And that, you know, with a complete stranger that you haven't talked to, so rather it will be the WH cleft. And here's a difference between WH clefts and it clefts. A uh, related difference concerns the topicality of the relative clause. Consider this example here. Uh, somebody asked, where did you meet your wife? You can answer that by saying, well, it was in Paris that I met my wife. Um, or you could say, where I met my wife was in Paris. So both the it cleft and the WH cleft work. Um, when the topic is, um, well, meet your wife, that's already established as a topic. <clears throat> uh, compare that to the second example here. Why are you so interested in Paris? You can answer that by saying, it was in Paris that I met my wife. Um, so that seems to work. But why are you so interested in Paris? Where I met my wife was in Paris. That does not seem to work so well. So it seems that there is a difference between it clefts and wh clefts in that it clefts allow you to smuggle in a non-topical element through the relative clause, whereas uh, in wh clefts the stuff that you present in the relative clause um, that needs to be topical already. You can't just create new topics with wh clefts. Um, a fourth difference is more down-to-earth grammatical, namely there are restrictions on WH clefts. Um, there are only so many WH words, and even so, WH clefts are largely restricted to sentences with what and who. So, it's champagne that I like corresponds to what I like is champagne. It was John who we saw corresponds to who we saw was John. Uh, but then, you have all sorts of it clefts that correspond to rather dubious examples of WH clefts. It was behind the books that I hid it. Where I hid it was behind the books. Yeah, yeah. Where I went, my wife was in Paris. It's, it works under certain circumstances. It's in 10 minutes that the train will depart. When the train will depart is in 10 minutes. I don't know. It was for personal reasons that he left. Why he left was for personal reasons. No. <clears throat> it was with relief that she heard the door close. Um, how she heard the door close was with, with relief. 
no, I'm having really uh, a hard time accepting that. And then, of course, there are it clefts that have no uh, WH cleft um, correspondences whatsoever. It was under protest that the kids ate their vegetables. How the kids ate their vegetables was under protest? Nah. Um, it was in no time that they had finished their ice creams. Um, how fast the kids finished their ice creams was in no time. No, that's word soup, really. It was despite his best efforts that t things took a turn for the worse. Again, uh, there is no real counterpart in terms of a WH cleft. So, to sum all of this up, uh, information packaging constructions are constructions that are sensitive to the structure of the communicative situation. Um, so they're pragmatic, they are sensitive to what has been said before, what has not been said before, and what the hero can be expected to know already. So they are pragmatic constructions that are conventional tools for the intersubjective management of information. Yeah, fascinating stuff.